This is WCM's Park Update, a weekly show covering the outdoor hospitality industry hosted by Ben Quiggle and Mike Gast. During each episode, you'll hear from special guests and campground experts on topics that will help your park flourish. WCM's Park Update is a production of Woodall's Campground Magazine. Hi, I'm Ben Quiggle, editor of Woodall's Campground Magazine, and this is another episode of WCM's Park Update, sponsored by Spot Tonight. And, of course, my esteemed colleague, Mike Gass, is here, the founder, president, do-everything person for the Emi Ola Group. Wow, that's as close as we ever come. Yeah, that's as close as we're going to get. And then our guests today are uh, two well-known faces in the campground industry, especially for Campground of America Park owners. Um... Josh Bell and Clint Bell. Josh is the Vice President of Operations and Finance for Campground Enterprises Incorporated, which owns seven properties throughout the, you know, mainly in, I think, in the western part of the U.S. And then uh, his brother is uh, Clint Bell is here as well. He's the part owner and Vice President of Development, Design, and Construction for Campground Enterprises Incorporated. So uh, it's exciting to have you guys on. So you guys, you guys are, you know, work for the same company, your brothers, but you live in two different areas of the country, right? That's true. Je- oh, Clint. Oh, we, lost. Clint, we lost you, Ken. Clint got muted. Um, but anyway, jo- Josh, so you, you live close to St. Louis, correct? Correct. Yeah. So I, I live in St. Louis, Missouri. You know, originally we are kind of all from San Diego where we, where we grew okay. up. Um, but I've lived in the Midwest now for, gosh, the uh, better part of the last 15 years. All right. And Clint, you're in San Diego still or? Yep. Yeah. Down in the, down in the kind of the Northern reaches of San Diego, but uh, okay. in that, in that greater San Diego area. And it looks like you have the background of a, of one of the parks behind you, I guess. So where are you at? Are you at the San Diego location or? Uh, no, right now we're at our Vail Lake Resort. Uh, that's Mecula KOA, um, and okay. uh, I will apologize because uh, early mornings uh, in the common spaces on a campground have blowers and uh, all that kind of good stuff going on, which was not predictable. Well, well, we can't we can't hear anything, but I wish I was at the park. I mean, it's probably a beautiful <laughs> location. So, yeah, it's it's gorgeous. It's uh, we, this park is is unique in the fact that it sits on the developed part of the campground sits on about three hundred and sixty four acres of kind of oak valleys and that kind of good stuff out here just east of the temecula area which is kind of known as southern california's wine country okay yeah i'm not a big wine drinker but uh i mean you know the wineries are always beautiful so it's got to be a beautiful location so um i guess you know can you guys just give us a little bit of background on kei um you know maybe how it got started you know what you guys you guys all have campground of america themed parks, I guess, correct? Yeah, that, that's right. So, so you know, Campgrounds Enterprises, the, the, the company got started in 1968 by our grandfather um, and grandmother. So they took a flyer on five acres of leased ground in, in uh, what was National City and um, kind of a part of an old dairy farm and uh, decided to build a small, K, a small KOA campground. Um, and, you know, obviously 55 something years later, um, we've been fortunate to go from that one property in San Diego to seven KOAs. Um, yeah, scattered across Southern California, Northern Arizona, and then one in Missouri. Yeah, well, that's awesome. And I know um, here at Woodalls, we've written some about the history of your company and uh, how you guys got started and the parks that you guys own. And you guys own a variety of different um style parks, I guess, correct? Do you guys, you know, I think there's uh, three different brands, Holiday Resort and Journey and the KOA portfolio. Do you own parks in each of those segments? Yep. Yeah, we sure do. And I guess, um, are most of your parks family oriented or, you know, do you own parks that are, you know, more adult themed and, and stuff or mainly all of them family oriented, I guess? Yeah, I mean, in keeping with the kind of the KOA brand and the KOA brand philosophy, you know, it's something that is open to all campers of all types of any way that you'd like to get out and camp. So certainly we've got lots of capability and opportunity for recreation for family involvement. That doesn't mean that there is not seasons where we have more of, a, of, a, of an adult community, uh, certainly in the wintertime in Southern California with lots of snowbird travel and the like. Uh, but most of the time we are geared for just about everybody to camp any way you like it. 
So I, I, I full disclosure, I've known these two guys since uh, their dad, Mike, was trying to trust them driving the golf carts around and uh, a long, long time. And they've just uh, the family was just uh, our, our best example. All the all the time I was a KOA of campground operations, we used them all the time for uh, for guidance. And uh, we tried things on them and just to watch that Chula Vista location develop into a resort. Uh, it was just spectacular what you guys ended up with there. Uh, what do you uh, what do you look for when you go out and try to pick the next location? I know you you guys have been on the ground uh, ground up type of development in, in some of the California locations. You've taken over some uh, somewhat distressed properties too. What do you look for when you're when you're looking to expand? Um. You know, so we were, uh, you know, obviously 50 years of, of being fortunate to, to have that background experience, like you say, and Mike um, in, in Chula Vista. And, and yeah, the, the San Diego KOA Resort, you know, will always kind of be the, the flagship property for us. But, you know, when we were fortunate enough to start to get out and look to expand, um, our, um, our, our first effort at that was the Grand Canyon KOA. So a little uh, journey, a, a little small park in, in Williams, Arizona, um, you know, very, very different than the San Diego KOA, um, less than 100 sites open seasonally. Um, but I think our, our first foray into trying to decide how that might work and trying out having managers on site and, and working on it from afar um, was certainly to look for a location that, that the guests were going to come to no matter what. Um, and so certainly the Grand Canyon is the, one of the biggest draws, uh, you know, from the national park standpoint, and we, we figured that um, we could get out there and, and we could certainly try a lot of things and fail and fail forward and, you know, be successful in other ways. And, um, um, and that was our kind of our first opportunity to, to really try it out. Um, following that, you know, we've certainly tried to be strategic about, um, yeah, I think fi finding properties that were a bit undervalued or um, were in need of, of redevelopment or repositioning. Um, um, and that's certainly where we've probably kind of found a bit of our niche is in some of those kind of smaller size properties that um, really would fit well into the KOA portfolio as well. So, you know, we're big believers in the brand. Um, and then, you know, we've been able to kind of then as we work through a few of those layer and uh, up some of those um, into bigger types of opportunities. So, um, and then, and then finally be able to do a couple of conversions. So we converted a park in Palm Springs. Um, you know, there had been no KOA in Palm Springs for over 20 years. And so it was exciting to convert a property there and, and apply the brand. And like I say, where Clint is sitting today is, is really kind of, a um, it's a special, special place, you know, for us, you know, I think as a campground, as a, uh, campground operator or as guys like us that have grown up in the industry um you know it is kind of a dream to have a property like that um that we can kind of really go and revitalize and, and set the stage for you know many many years to come so clayton you spent a lot of time coming up uh working on the recreation and what the what the campground users want when they're experiencing gateway camping how has that changed in, in in your lifetime how is it Changed from when you were a kid, and and, and uh, where you sit now, and what are campers really after when they're there? Well, you know, as, as yeah, hard hard to say, right? Every, every camper is unique. Every camper is different. I think that the interior core of every camper is they're looking for an opportunity to relax, get out into nature, get outside a little bit, and either spend time with friends or spend time with family uh, and explore wherever they're at, whether that's inside the campground or in the location that surrounds it. Um, so recreational activities have always been focused on being a part of that experience, but not necessarily dominating that experience, right? We, we wanted to offer things that people could come and participate in to offer a sense of community. And, and back in the day, it was always about following those trends. You know, we did karaoke night. Josh and I once dressed up as the Blues Brothers and hosted karaoke at the San Diego KOA. And it was awesome. And it brought all walks of life and all kinds of people to the to the stage uh, so much anymore. I, I don't know that the young people are into the karaoke, but, you know, we start doing other things, bike, desk, bike decorating contests and opportunities for parades. And, you know, I think as campground operators and as recreation opportunities, we sort of foster that community engagement and then let the relationships that are built because of those recreations start to bloom inside of the campground. Uh, you know, again, in a lot of operations, it's going to be very dependent on the type of guest that's coming through in the Grand Canyon. 
you know, we might put on something in the evening that is uh, a stargazing or is just a, a real small communal fire or communal s'mores. But for the most part, guests are sort of on their way in and on their way out. That's the nature of that journey part. They're not staying for a great many days. But when you look at San Diego or when you look at Temecula, the guest is here for multiple days, two, three, even four nights sometimes. And so providing an opportunity for them to interact in the community is, is really important. In Temecula, we have access to a lake and water is magic and people can go out and go fishing. We have access to 760 acres of recreational environment that has a world-class mountain biking park that's a part of it. Um, so the community here does a lot of outside, you know, mountain biking and, and hiking and that kind of good stuff. So it's a really unique opportunity to see the ways that different campers interact. But I think, again, it all comes back to how can we facilitate and foster the growth of a community around a campfire to get campers to know one another, because that's the unique part about camping. How, um, you know, how have you guys incorporated glamping into what you guys do in your park operations? I guess um, I know, Josh, you uh, work with eco structures and I know you guys have some of those set up. Do you guys have a variety of different glamping options? Do you guys have wagons and yurts and all that kind of stuff at your parks? Um, yeah, no, we, so we do. And, and, you know, I think our, our kind of journey in the glamping space started, gosh, I mean, the better part of 20 years ago, um, you know, at our first kind of go at, at some canvas sided structures and canvas sided tents, um, you know, and, and fast forward to today and is, is, um, we're actively making sure that there is some bit of glamping element on, on all of the properties. And, you know, mm -hmm. when you look at a KOA campground and, and, you know, I think, how do we define glamping, whether that is, um, you know, hard walled cabins as well as soft sided accommodation. Um, you know, certainly as we've tried to kind of set up five year redevelopment plans for all of our properties, um, a, a key element of that is is adding some bit of unique accommodation. And, and in most of those cases, that has been a soft sided tent. Um, so in San Diego, we've got four great eco tents. Um, yep, up at the William Circle Pines KOA, we've got, uh, we've got wagons, um, we have teepees, we have, you know, other canvas tents. Um, so we, we certainly believe that there is a market at each one of the properties. Um, to be able to have them and you know we've also been as a as a um growing multiple park operator um you know we've certainly been big believers in trying to find consistency with what we're doing so that it's we're not having to reinvent the wheel every time we're trying to to put up a new structure um, um but then also kind of curated a little bit so that it's unique to the area um where you know we're super excited we've been we've been pounding away for the last few years on a on an amazing glamping development that'll be up there in temecula um at some point um, so yeah, no, I, I think, uh, a key part of, of every park that we will have on our portfolio, we, we know we will set aside, you know, X number of sites for glamping accommodations to accommodate guests in the future. So, so it's, let's talk about the future guests for a second. What do they look like? What do they look like the last few years? Are they getting younger, less experienced? Do you have to uh, spend some time making sure that they know what they're doing on the campground? You know, I, I think the, the, the guest profile is certainly skewing a little bit younger. We've seen a lot of investment in sort of that van life culture, a little bit of that, you know, kind of you only live once opportunity and, and folks that are getting out. And there is a little bit of, of education that still goes on. But I think you find that those who are willing to go out and purchase an RV or purchase some sort of a, a you know trailer or motor home, um, they're, they're getting themselves schooled up. It, it doesn't matter how young or old the client is. It's really, is this their first RV or is it their second RV or have they been at it a little while? And you're still finding opportunities to help guide them into how to make the best use of it. Um, but I think we're starting to see folks that are really wanting to get into the outdoors that want to experience that camping environment, but may not have the capital to invest in an RV. And so things like glamping tents and things like other roofed accommodation opportunities just allow us to sort of expand, you know, and, and it gives it a safe place for people to explore that opportunity, right? You don't have to teach them how to open a door and, and climb into a bed that's already made or use a barbecue that's already like they've got out on their, their patio at home. But more importantly, it, it, it allows them to be comfortable in that environment and then start to explore what other options that they might look at. They might graduate into purchasing an RV. Is there... On if we started out in glamping. Yep. Is there, you know, a group of RVers that maybe, you know, put the RVs away for a weekend and want to try glamping too? Maybe they have an RV and they also want to do glamping to some degree. You see you know, that? I, I, uh, 
I think the fun thing about the addition of glamping or, or accommodation in general, and I mean, let's face it, I mean, the, the addition of accommodation to the industry here in the U.S. over the course of the last 20 years is, is had, I, I mean, it is, it is what is giving the industry newfound life. Um, and I think the big part of that is because for every one of those guests that does have an RV and it's a family that's passionate about being outside, um, their friends or their friends' kids live down the street and they would love to go and do something with them. But to Clint's mm -hmm. point, they're not really interested in buying or owning an RV. So, uh, you know, that ability to have a, a place that the guests can bring their RV and then the friends or family um, can be able to stay in some sort of accommodation on site. Um, certainly in our destination type properties, like San Diego and, and Temecula, um, that's absolutely how the guests are, are using those particular locations is, is to be able to go and go, at, go camping with their friends. Um, so, um, you know, how many people then are, are putting the RV away and trying out the, the, the cabin on the weekends? Um, I don't know, I don't, that one's probably hard to say. I'm sure there are some that are out there and doing that, but, um, you know, I think it's the folks that, it, you know, where we, where we see it a lot is the, it's the extra family members and it's the extra friends that are coming that want to be along with those guests in the RV. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, we have to pause for a second to recognize our sponsor spot tonight, and then we will be back with uh, Josh and Clint after the break. Supercharge your campground bookings with Spot Tonight, the number one commission-free OTA for RV parks and campgrounds. Through integrations with top property management systems, Spot Tonight displays real-time outdoor accommodation inventory with a marketplace where campers can search for and instantly book campsites. Best of all, it's 100% free for operators. Visit partners.spottonight.com to get listed and unlock access to over 60 million campers. Hi, welcome back to WCM's Park Update, and we are talking with Josh and Clint Bell um, from Campground Enterprise Incorporated and just talking a little bit about their parks and some of the things they have going on at their parks. I guess, what do you guys, you know, what's the evaluation process you guys go through when you're looking at adding a new amenities or new accommodation units? I guess, I imagine you guys have a ton of research that you look at when you're adding new things, I guess. What's that process look like? Well, I think from a, from a, I'll, I'll speak to the ground side and I'll let Josh speak to the, yeah. you know, the financial evaluation side. So, you know, when we look at the park and we look at how we can physically develop it, I'm always looking at how do we create a, a good camping experience? It's not, it's not okay to just, you know, slam in things because it's the hot new trend, but does it fit with the particular environment that it's, it's going into? Does it make sense to put in a patio or put in a signature <clears throat> site? Does it make sense to put in a cabin? You know, how can we convert a space that is perhaps uh, not used most efficiently and make it better and more efficient. You know, can we re-angle sites for easier access? So really it starts off with sort of a holistic viewpoint of what's an area that needs renovation, that needs investment, and then what type of sites can we get in there to provide the best camping experience from a design and a development standpoint? And then it comes down to what's in the ground. What what infrastructure do we have? Do we, ha do we have to redo wholesale power? Do we have to redo wholesale septic and water? Um, and, and how do we best affect that both quickly and effectively without, you know, having to tear up the entire park and all the systems in the park just to affect one particular upgrade? Yeah. And I think, you know, as, as we've kind of looked at that, you know, we, we certainly, um, uh, I, you know, the, I, you know, speaking uniquely to the roof accommodation side, uh, you know, I think for years, um, the math was pretty easy. Right. Um, I mean, you could you could get your hands on a deluxe cabin or a park model RV um, and, and make the math work pretty, pretty quick if, for, for, for most major markets. And again, we're pretty fortunate that we're only operating in some major tourism markets. Um, you know, today, the cost to, to, to put those units in has, has gone up a lot. Um, um, and so, you know, as we're evaluating how many and when, um, you know, I, so all all six out of the seven of our properties all are, are all year round operations. Um, you know, I, I love to look at the kind of 200 nights a year in a, in a, in a unit number to say, if we're booking it out 200 nights a year, um, chances are we've got, we, we still have untapped demand for future. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's every weekend of the year plus a hundred midweek nights. Um, you know, I mean, um, we are, we are not certainly in the camp of saying, oh gosh, we're going to be able to run that like a hotel. We're going to get 90% occupancy of our units. Um, but you know, I think, um, 
that combination of 200 nights a year. And then, you know, are we in a market that, that can really support the 200, you know, the, the 200 to 250 a night net um, ADR uh, on that site? And as long as we're in that type of, of space, then we probably feel like there's additional demand to do it. Um, so, um, you know, that, that, and that really, does, that has changed dramatically now as we've kind of looked at, at some of the different properties, um, you know, especially where um, they may run a little bit more seasonally um, or where we're also now having to say, hey, we've got this high value um, or a couple of high value full hookup RV sites you know, is it now really worth transitioning those into a roofed accommodation unit when we are going to have to forego the revenue of the of the sites? So I think, um, you know, I think we've been um, as our as our maturity has gone through the, the or the growth part of, of owning multiple properties. You know, we're certainly better now about kind of taking a look at some of that stuff every few years, um, trying to kind of set the plan for the next four or five years. And then, um, you know, and then reevaluating again just to see where we're at. So how are you handling staffing now? <clears throat> Is staffing become a real uh, hard, hard thing to get past right now? Or do you do it locally? Do you bring in more work campers? Yeah, staffing is, is staffing is hard, I think, all across, you know, certainly in Southern California, we see an, an ever growing increase in both in minimum wage and the like. And, and so but we're also fortunate to be in population dense areas in Southern California. So we can tap that that local market for for staff and for and for help, uh, you know, from whatever we need to do. So there's a there's a bit of a dichotomy in some of the more remote parts. You know, work campers certainly are the only answer because the the commute time from a major city or a major place where they might reside is just not practical. And how's that work pool for, for work campers? Has it been going up? Is there more people out there available as work campers? That's a good question, Mike. Um, you know, so the, the third the third member of our of, of our the third leg of our stool is is our sister, um, Molly Crawford, um, who kind of acts now as our, our VP of human resources. Um, mm. So, you know, we have we are now fairly consistently we have about 260 employees on on staff year round across the seven properties. Um, so, you know, we have certainly dedicated now a whole full time, you know, kind of resource to, to really managing some of those. Help, helping our GMs with recruitment and retention. Um, yeah, to, to, I think to re-echo Clint's point, you know, I think our, our focus has been, if we're in a market where we feel like we can hire out of the local community, we hire out of the local community. Um, you know, really Williams, Arizona is really our only market where um, we are we really have to bring in staff from the outside. And so, you know, for those particular properties, we've, um, uh, you know, I, they, they have had great luck in recent years. You know, I think they've, they've found a great steady pool of folks in, in, in the work camper pool that are interested in coming out and, and staying with them for the season. Um, but it is no doubt it is it is it is the challenge every single year. And um, like I say, yeah, it, the, the, the costs of some of that stuff just continue to kind of come up. Um, I think one of, the and, shifts, one of the shifts and, we saw in the work camper pool over the last couple of years, and it could have been a COVID halo or COVID effect, is that the, the average age of the typical yeah. work camper certainly decreased at, when, mm. when COVID happened. We started to see a lot more younger applicants in the work camper pool and wanting to pursue that type of life. So, I mean, that gives... It's it's a great it's a great thing to have. It's a great blend to have to you know that it's not just a retiree that's looking for a couple couple of hours a week. It's, it's somebody who's young and hungry and really wants to be a yeah. part of the the industry. Yeah, and then I think KOA. I know we wrote an article um, in January, I believe Jeff Kreider did for the magazine about this KOA internship program, the way they're working with uh, colleges, and I believe at least some of those students from the San Diego area took a tour of your uh, San Diego Metro KOA resort. And I guess that's another pipeline too, that potentially is coming down where more students are being exposed to the outdoor hospitality industry, I guess. Yeah. And I think, yeah, we've been, really... go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, <laughs> oh yeah. I'll say, but I mean, again, Mo Molly has been really fortunate to be looped in yeah. with, the, with the, the team at KOA there. And I, I know they have bought, in fact, she is on, the, she's on the road this morning um, to a university with, uh, with the folks at KOA to, to do it in more interviews for that internship program. And they've been in San Diego. Um, they just recently did a big, a big stint up here in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, you know, where there's another big hospitality school with, with students that have a kind of an, a passion for the outdoors. And um, I, you know, yeah, we certainly, it's a, it's a great 
reason why we are thrilled to be part of the brand um, is that they are going after programs or setting up programs like that that we cer we certainly couldn't you know manage on our own. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's kind of interesting what you mentioned about the work campers getting younger. I, I just got back from a conference in Wisconsin, and that's um, what they were saying during one of the sessions too. Was it's you know you, you, it's not just fifty plus people out there anymore. It's young couples and like even younger families that are looking for those kind of uh, jobs. So it's kind of interesting to see how park owners kind of have to adapt to that too, I guess. So, so with your footprint guys, you've got a great view of what the industry is going to look like this summer. How, how's it looking? Are we going to have a big year? Is it going to be just a mediocre year out there? That's a great question, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I know the, the 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 crystal ball, you know, and I think campground. I think campground owners alike, you know, we were just out at a you know a group of KOA multiple property owners that that were you know discussing that. I think uh, you know certainly everybody's taking a look to see. I mean, there, look, there there is no doubt there is some softness, um, you know, in the forward reservations. I mean, we're you know we're just. I, it's it's um I, I think everybody's having to kind of and us included of, of re kind of level set to that to say are we going are we what are we comparing that to so you know I think the year that we're going to have ahead is going to be a great year um you know is it is going to be as good as one of those peak COVID years no you know but um compared to six or seven years ago I mean yeah we're you know it's it's going to be an awesome year but um I think the uh the the challenge now is all of those guests returning to some kind of pre-covid travel trends you know that that uh where we were really we were fortunate to see a lot more growth in the midweek business um you know now we're gonna have to work a lot harder uh to to get some of that back and you know some of it just uh, Again, for us being in very much in the family market, uh, you know, we're kind of recognizing that some of it we know we just won't be back. You know, I mean, families just don't want to go camping in the third and fourth week of August anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they want to be home and get ready for the school year. So um, it certainly makes us put on our creative thinking hats about how what, what we could do to entice people out. So how about KEI? Is there number eight on the horizon? <laughs> oh, there. There's, there's, there's always, there's always, you know, viewfinders that are on. I mean, I think that's one of those things that we've gotten ourselves to a point where if, if the right, if the right plan and opportunity, you know, came to pass, there's, there's always that possibility, but it's not, it's not something that we're out there actively hunting at this point in time. There's a lot of, yeah, the market, a, the market got pretty frothy. Side, there's a lot of work to do on the seven that we have. So, you know, yeah. growing, growing a little bit more is a, is, is, a yeah. bit, uh, is a bit audacious. You know, I'd say circling back to one of your original questions was how did we identify property? How did we, how did we pick the properties that we decided to grow into? And, you know, every, every property that we own um, all have vacant land. So, you know, not only, not only is there an ability and a need to redevelop what's in there, you know, at each of those locations, we can expand. And so I think that was high on our list as we went to evaluate those properties to say, hey, gosh, when the right time comes, we'll go and develop that new five or six or seven acres, you know, and, and add to the site inventory, you know, if the market will, will bear it. So, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, um, I think that pretty much wraps up the show. Uh, it, I mean, it's always fun seeing you, Clint and Josh. And obviously, I hear Clint a lot at the K Way convention. And then, uh, and then, uh, Josh, That's a nice way to say it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's, very, then, kind. that's very kind way, Ben. Thank you. And, and you're, you're you're welcome. And then, uh, Josh, uh, I usually see both of you guys at the glamping show too. You guys are busy working the eco structures booth that you normally have set up there. So. Um, I imagine I'll see you guys out there again, maybe in October, but, um, it's always great seeing you guys and hearing what you guys are up to. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Thanks for having yeah. us. And, uh, thanks everyone for watching and we will be back again next week. Thank you for listening to WCM's park update, a production of Woodall's campground magazine. Join us for a new show each Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on Facebook, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn for daily news and updates, and subscribe to our news feed on our website at woodallscm.com.